Hi. Would you like to sign up for your free library card today? Yes, I would. But before we get to that, I'm John Evans. You're watching the Pick Connection. We are at the Carnegie Free Library in Connellsville today, and we are going to explore all the great resources here at the library with Casey Sorokman's help. So please stay with us, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Pick Connection. With me now is John Malone, and John is the president of the Carnegie Free Library here in Collinsville. And John, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Well, thank you for having us here today. John, this is a fantastic uh, looking library, and you're going to tell our viewers the history of the library. Yeah, this uh, library came not without controversy. Uh, when it started back in 1899, a bunch of citizens got together and they wrote a letter to Andrew Carnegie. Uh, to build a library in town. Uh, through the philanthropy of Andrew Carnegie, uh, he built approximately 2,509 libraries throughout the world, mm. the first one being in Scotland, and the first one uh, in this area uh, was in Pittsburgh near uh, Homestead due to the Coke ovens. Uh, Andrew thought it was very, very important that we had books and knowledge for people, uh, especially in the communities that supported his business. Mm -hmm. um, after the city forefathers wrote that letter to Carnegie, within weeks they got a letter back uh, of him agreeing to build a library in, in the city of Connellsville, provided that they found land suitable, they found a design that was uh, worthy of bearing the Carnegie name, and that the city forefathers would pass a tax to keep the library supported through uh, the operation side of the business uh, for the life of the library. Uh, so it took a few years and they started construction in the early 1900s and it was built in 1903. What was quite controversial about this uh, location was that the school district actually purchased it uh, uh, through a condemnation. It used to be the Connell Graveyard. Really? And they excavated the bodies and they moved them down the road and uh, uh, people at the time said they could never get all the bodies out of here, uh, especially due to the fact that uh, the people that had relatives living here had to pay for the exhuming of those bodies oh. to be moved, and so some of them didn't do it. And so there are thoughts today that the library is haunted, <laughs> if you believe in that sort of stuff. Uh, but the library did get uh, uh, built. It mm -hmm. took about two years. Uh, the external structure, the stone came from Ohio, it was quarried there uh, and used in the uh, construction. The cost at that time was $50,000 and what was quite uh, uh, funny about the whole process when they got finished with this building, they didn't have enough money to do the steps out front and the landscaping. Uh -huh. So they went to Pittsburgh to meet with Andrew Carnegie and said we need another $10,000. And he basically threw them out of the library or out of his offices and said, "Hey, uh, you know, I gave you fifty thousand. Find a way to finish it." Wow. Uh, they came back to Connellsville with their tail between the legs, and what ended up happening was they got a telegraph saying, "Hey, I was having a bad day. Uh, I'll get you a check for ten thousand dollars to finish it." And we have the letter and we have it framed with a autographed picture of Andrew Carnegie here. That yeah. is fantastic. So it's, uh, yeah. it's been a long history. It took two years to build. Uh -huh. uh, then when it was opened, uh, there were some people that were against the tax, so they put it on a referendum, and it passed. And from that point on, for 100 years, we've had a library in Connellsville. Wow. And our most recent renovation is the room in which we're sitting. That Beautiful occurred. room, yes. It occurred in 19, or I'm sorry, 2003, I think is when we finished it. A gentleman by the name of Elmer Geddes uh, used to study here. He was almost 90 years old. No one knew of him. He left town when he was 17. And he gave us $150,000 to redo this room. He mm. remembered it as a glorious place when he was a kid. So we hired an architect that uh, we found old pictures of the exact uh, stenciling that was done on the ceiling and we painted this room to look exactly the way it did in 1903 wow. when it was open. It's so beautiful. This is almost an exact replica and this room has received a lot of accolades through a lot of architectural digests, if you will, and uh, I think it's turned out extremely well. Yes, it has. John, do you know if Andrew Carnegie, did he make an appearance when his library opened here? I, I don't know if he did, uh, but I can tell you this. At the time that this library was built, uh, he had funded nearly half of the libraries in the United States. Again, he built 
2,509 libraries, and at that time there were about 3,500 in the United States. He built them from about 1884 uh, up through the early 1900s, 1920 area, for about a 35-year period somewhere in that area. And what ended up happening was that uh, there were so many, I don't know if he ever came here. Mm -hmm. I guess we could go back and look at uh, yeah. some of the accounts. I did find out by looking through our, some of our old newspaper records, the first book ever ever taken out of this library was from a young girl on Fairview Avenue, which is oh, within walking wow. distance from here, and it was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oh, wow. It was the book. So uh, there's That's a lot of history here. Yes, there is. Well, John, uh, thank you so much for the, uh, the history of the library. A little bit later on in the show, you'll be talking with uh, Tim Yorkison of the Private Industry Council, who's the president, and about the partnership that uh, you've formed uh, with the Private Industry Council, and that'll be a little bit later on in the show. But thanks for coming on right now and uh, talking about the history of the library. Thank you. All right. We'll be back after this brief message. Visit the Private Industry Council website at www.privateindustrycouncil.com. We offer employer services, SAGE skills assessment, personal services, basic workplace skills, government procurement assistance program, customized job training, employer tax incentives, homeless prevention and rapid rehousing programs, welfare programs, and pathways out of poverty, services, training and certifications, eligibility, pathways for employers and pathways for partners, education, adult education services, education and technology, youth services, early childhood development, the Head Start of Fayette County, Dad's Matter, Pre-K Counts, Steve Corson's Newsletters, Community Benefits such as the PIC Connection, Telecommunication Center, Community Technology, Links, Contact Information, the Message Board, and Job openings. The Private Industry Council of Westmoreland Fayette, where needs are met, goals are reached. You can also find the Private Industry Council of Westmoreland Fayette on Facebook, just search Private Industry Council for updates and information. Hello, I'm John Malone, and you are watching The Pick Connection. Welcome back to The Pick Connection. With me now is Tammy Osagovich and Brett Baumgartel. We'll be talking about the adult education program here in Carnegie Free Library. Let me start out by uh, Brett here asking you a question. Brett, uh, how do you envision using library resources uh, for your classes? I can see numerous ways that I can use the library, and that's one thing I definitely want to do. I want to make sure that all my students, when they leave here, understand that there are resources in the local area that they can use not only to help them get a job, but also to help them learn more and understand that learning is something that goes with you. And whether it's just to getting a library card or showing them where they can get resources online mm -hmm. or on microfiche or anything else that they have in the library that can help them become better people and better employees, I'm all for. Okay, what are your goals for your students? When they leave my program, they understand that life, I mean, that, excuse me, that learning is for a lifetime. And I just don't want them to get a job. I want them to have a career. And I want them to have a career at something that they love to do. Okay. And I want to help them market themselves the best way they can so they're able to achieve their goals. Uh, Brett, how can you keep your students motivated after they've passed their GED? It comes down to understanding that what you do in life is who you are. And if you love doing what you're doing as your life's work, you're going to love and then you're going to then you're going to respect yourself and understand who you are as a person. And that's just going to lend itself to having pride in yourself, having value in your work and you're going to want to learn more and you're going to want to pass on uh, those uh, values mm -hmm. to others. A lot of my students have children, young children, and they want to be role models and they want to be mentors for their children. And if I can help them do that by understanding and learning how important it is to having, um, having a uh, family-sustaining uh, career uh -huh. and how that translates into having a better life for you and your child, I'm all for it. And that's, and that's, what, I, and that's what I'm looking to do with all my students. Good, good. Well, Brett, thank you so much. You're doing thank a great you. job. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now let me get to a wonderful person, Tammy O. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy, uh, can you talk a little bit about the partnership here between the Private Industry Council and the Carnegie Free Library? Sure. Um, when we received our grant um, this year, uh, we decided to investigate having classes here in Connellsville. 
So it was just natural for us to think about the library because, again, it's all, within all the resources that are available mm -hmm. to students. And what are the goals and objectives of the adult education program? Well, I'm so glad that Brett took some time to talk about um, uh, employment. The, the goal of adult education really is transitioning. Uh, many people think that adult education is just for anybody who needs their GED. And although GED is a goal of ours, um, we teach GED skills in the context of work. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes in, uh, anyone comes in, if they have a GED or if they have a high school diploma um, or if they're in need of a high school diploma, everything that we do is in the, in the context of work. So if someone comes in and they're interested in getting their GED but they're also interested in being, becoming a machinist, we're going to teach those GED skills in the context of machining, like math for machinists. If we're teaching reading skills, we're going to teach reading skills possibly using an article that's related to machining. Same with any other industry they might be interested in. So our whole goal is really to transition them either into post-secondary um, education or training programs okay. or into employment. We want them to have a self-sustaining employment, as Brett mentioned. Um, the other thing that we do in our adult education program is we try to simulate a work environment. So they have to be on time. They have to call if they're unable to make it. You know, earlier Brett gave them a break and said 10 minutes. They were back in 10 minutes. Yeah. So it, we really do um, encourage uh, them to, to embrace this as they, as they would employment. And again, just develop those soft skills, which we know employers are looking for. Someone who's going to be timely, someone who's going to be able to work in teams, someone who's going to be able to communicate effectively, um, someone who can overcome barriers. So if they can't come to class one day, they're encouraged to take a look at what prevented them from being here and make arrangements that they can be here the next day, just like an employer would expect. So it's a lot of career exploration, mm -hmm. um, a lot of contextualized learning, and um, in an environment that is just absolutely, I think, beautiful. It is, it is. Now, who is eligible to participate? Anyone. As long as they live in Pennsylvania, they're eligible to participate in our program. Um, students must be no younger than 16 and officially withdrawn from school and as old as whatever. Okay. Yeah. And what are the hours here? Brett, do you want to? The schedule uh, is Monday and Wednesdays. I'm here from 12. 30 for my first session, 12.30 to 3.30, and then I have an evening session from 4.30 to 7.30, and then Tuesday and Thursday, my classes are from 9 to 12, and then from 1 to 4. Okay, good. And uh, right now, we're going to go back upstairs here in the library, and we'll be talking to the director, Casey Saroakman, so please stay with us, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Pit Connection. I'm John Evans. Hey, if you have any comments or questions about today's show, please email me at J Evans at privateindustrycouncil.com and I look forward to hearing from you. All right, welcome back to the Pit Connection. With me right now is Casey Soakman and she is the director of the Carnegie Free Library here in Connellsville. Casey, what room are we in right now? This is our reading room. We have a lot of patrons that come here to look at the newspapers and the magazines. Also our large print books we have specialized computers in here for the visually impaired. It's our adaptive technology. And we also have our microfilm reader. A lot of people come in and they will try to research their history um, in their family history. If they mm -hmm. have a specific date in mind, then they're able to look at the microfilm of the really old newspapers dating back in, to the late 1800s. Oh, wow. We have from the Courier um, here, the Connellsville Courier newspaper. So. They'll look at the new newspapers, they'll look at the old newspapers, they'll sit, relax, look at large print books, and you know, we'll have some visually impaired uh, individuals that come in from time so to time. So a lot of research can go on in this room. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's very you know, conducive to research and reading, and Great. it's kind of relaxing. Great. This is a nice room, though, mm -hmm. Casey. Thank you. Casey, now where are you going to take me next? We're going to head over to our stacks, and we'll look at actual books. Oh, all right. Library. Books. Okay. Well, let's go. Welcome back to the Pit Connection um, with Casey here in the lower stack area of the Carnegie Free Library. And Casey, what is this area? I know it's the lower stack, but exactly what is that? Um, the lower stacks house our nonfiction collection of our materials. These are for mainly adults, 
books only. Uh, for instance, there's different subject areas. We use the Dewey Decimal System here at the library in different areas and different numbers relate to different subjects. So, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, we're in the 600s right now, and there's books about resume building, yeah. and there's books about interviewing, and, you know, there's also... Um, Here's a cool one here, how to design and build fences and gates. Right, absolutely. That's great. So, there's something for everyone here yeah. in the nonfiction collection, and, you know, especially if you're interested, and we have, you know... Books for all people, you know, dummy books that are very, you know, lower level and, you know, easy to read. And then we have um, other books talking about, you know, 11 laws of likability. So there's something for everyone here at the Carnegie Free Library in the nonfiction section for sure. Well, there is. You know what, Casey? I did not realize how many books this library has. Yes, we actually have close to around 40,000 wow. books available. And if there is a book that we do not have, we can borrow it from another library. Any library from across the state of Pennsylvania, we're able to borrow a book and get it here sent, mailed uh -huh. to us from another library. And I can use my free library card to get down in here, huh? Absolutely. Great. Okay, Casey, where are we at now? We are in the children's section. We have a lot of children's books available for kids to come do research mm -hmm. and for schoolwork as well. We have a lot of children that come in for our story times. There's weekly preschool story times available and it happens right here in the children's section. We have a very colorful rug over in the corner. And speaking of colorful, we are now remodeling our children's section to match our rug, as we I say. I like those colors. I know, the gorgeous colors on the ceiling, different Crayola colors to make it more bright and cheery. In the and room. it is. Very much so. And we also have Saturday programs where the kids will sit at the little tables, and we have different programs available to them that are educational and also, you know, fun and creative, an opportunity for them to do crafts and, you know, explore and do different, yeah. you know, programs. What a wonderful area for kids. It is, and including in the area, last but not least, is the computers that they're able to do homework on and play games and, you know, come mm. in and meet in different groups and learn a lot of information yeah. and check the books out as often as they like. Yeah. We have a hard time sometimes getting children out of the children's room when they I come to it. visit. <laughs> we also have a lot of crying eyes and kicking yeah. and screaming and I don't want to go home, Mommy, because they love it here so much. They yeah. get to play and explore and read. You know, I've been in uh, several libraries in the area, Casey, and I'll have to say this is probably the largest children's area for a library I've seen. Wow, this is pretty cool, Casey. Uh, where are we at now? We are in the auditorium of the library. Yeah, I always wanted to be on stage. <laughs> it is quite amazing. It is. That there is an auditorium in, in the a library. library. I know. So the original Carnegie's were intended to be also community centers. Mm -hmm. Andrew Carnegie over a hundred years ago, was a visionary in that he thought that a library should be more than just a book repository and that it should also be a community center. So that's why we have this large auditorium up here that we're trying to utilize more yeah. and get more activities into this large space for the community, such as we have yoga here on Saturday available for a minimal five dollar donation all the money goes to the friends of the library and that organization obviously then supports the library yeah yeah there is a pick private industry council uh, classroom in our basement if you get a chance to look at it, it's very nice and it's for people that are getting their ged and they have kids that come there and they they they're renting a space and like I mentioned to some of you that came in a little earlier, our librarian is really doing, doing a fantastic job on trying to uh, promote our library to the community as well as uh, outer community. There's a lady here today from Uniontown, a couple people I believe, right? So our library, you know, the face of a library is changing. Um, when I was a young girl, 
we spent a lot of time here because we didn't have encyclopedias and internet and all that stuff, okay? And so it's still a wonderful place for reading, resources, computers, but we want this to become um, a real community place, a haven, and uh, we have beautiful spaces here, check them out. And we're also doing things like this yoga by donation to preserve this beautiful building, this historic building, and to keep it here in our community. So today, um, again, it, this is a great space because we have chairs if people want to modify. Remember, yoga is your own practice. It's not a comp competition. Um, and I, know, I, I like to pick on the young girls over there because a lot of um, younger people don't, don't usually um, like a lot of the gentle yoga because they're in that stage of their life where they're really, you know, they're still moving and grooving and all that. So, but you need to learn to relax as well, right, and calm yourself down. And Casey, your vision uh, that you just talked about, also uh, I know you're planning to have maybe a, a job fair later on in the next couple of months and a resume workshop. Right. So you're kind of trying to bring in the adults, the children also, yes. but uh, also you're thinking about the employment here in the area yeah. too. So yeah. what a great idea that, to utilize this space. I mean, it is a wonderful space. Hi, my name is Erin Parker. I'm an instructor at Snapology. This is our six-week animal robotics class. This week they're building a robotic alligator with a motion sensor inside. You're going to get to build a robotic alligator. Now what kind of movement do you think your alligator is going to do? This way. What kind of movement? Hmm. What do you think? Open their jaw um, and like bite. Okay. Maybe the movement you most commonly think of when you hear alligators, or you think about alligators, is this. We kind of do that with games we play in school or when you're in the pool swimming and you go alligator, the jaw's going open and shut. So that's what you're going to learn today to do today with your robotic alligator. Now there's a special part that you'll also learn how to use today with your robotic alligator. And that's going to be the motion sensor. So an alligator in the wild doesn't just walk around like this all the time. They only do that when they're trying to catch something to eat. So you're going to learn how to first just make your alligator open and close. Then you're going to learn how to put in the motion sensor and use the motion sensor so that when you put food in the alligator's mouth, he'll chomp down on it. So he won't just close any time, only when there's something in his mouth, like a real alligator. And we do a lot of our summer reading activities here in the auditorium during the summer, like our awards program for the wow. summer reading program. So we're inviting more people yeah. to come in and use this space because it is underutilized and we want to you know, get more people into the library and become essentially the hub of the community. What a great place. Welcome back to the Pit Connection. Hey, I received two emails from our previous show we did at Head Start, Early Head Start. And the first question I received is from a lady named Heather. Heather lives in the Uniontown area. And she wrote me, uh, John, how old does a child, child have to be to enroll in Head Start? Heather, the Head Start, early Head Start of Fayette County enrolls children from birth to five years old. Children birth to three years old can participate in the early Head Start program. And children from three to five years old can participate in our Head Start program. And Heather, for more information about enrollment, and qualifications, you can call 724-430-4818, extension 114, and you can speak to a supervisor. Now, the second question I received is from a gentleman by the name of Gene. Gene also lives in the Uniontown area, and Gene wants to know about how he can become a school bus driver. Gene, I'm glad you asked that question. You need to be 18 years of age or older. You must have a current Pennsylvania driver's license you must complete a CDL school bus physical. You must obtain a CDL permit from the Department of Transportation. And Gene, you must complete a CDL school bus 20 hour cer certification class. And Gene, for more information about becoming a CDL school bus driver, please call 724-430-4818, extension 103, and speak to the transportation coordinator. I hope that helps you out. 
Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. You know, uh, I promised John Evans I'd come out and finish the show because he's inside finishing up his application for that library card, and it's been a real pleasure here to come down here and do this at Carnegie Library, and I just can't thank you enough. It's probably been the easiest partnership that I've ever been part of because you really make it easy being the uh, chairman of the Private Industry Council Board, you're the president of the Carnegie Library Board, and you really make it easy to bring the mission and the goals and all the shared resources together in this community. Uh, you've been a great ambassador, not only for PMC uh, Bank, but uh, the Private Industry Council and here the library in Connellsville. So I want to thank you, and I know the people in Connellsville appreciate everything that you're doing here and a wonderful uh, effort that you bring to the community. Thanks. Th thank you, Tim. I had a teacher uh, back in sixth grade that said uh, once that half of knowledge is knowing where to find it. And I remember as a kid coming to this library, and I think it's important for every community to have one. And I personally want to thank PIC uh, for being an invaluable part of this library by not only being a tenant but helping us get grants and helping us actually keep the doors open because over the last three years it's been extremely we've been extremely challenged by the budget cuts of the state and, and what have you to try to keep the doors open plus we lost our librarian of about four decades and we were fortunate enough to find Casey to uh, fill those roles and uh, it's been a changing year here at the library it's been a great year as you can see, a lot of things are happening, and they wouldn't have happened without PIC. And so I personally want to thank you and your staff for lending their support to the library. And it's been a great partnership. Thanks again, John. Hey, thank you. Okay, super. Well, I've got all my books I want to read for the next couple of days. I'm excited to have these books. And make sure you come down to the Connellsville Carnegie Free Library and take advantage of all the great resources that are here. It's a great asset to the community. Well, I'm going to get my library card in. Uh-oh. I think I forgot my library card. Hey, come on, guys. Let me in. Almost that bad. Let me in.